Lawyers on the Line is brought to you by Falsani, Balmer, Peterson, Quinn, and Beyer. For nearly 40 years, answering the Northland's toughest legal questions. Helping you understand where you stand. Falsani, Balmer, Peterson, Quinn, and Beyer. Hello. Divorce is the most common legal proceeding in the United States. Equally common during a divorce are disputes over division of assets, custody, visitation with children. Good evening. I'm Jim Peterson, a partner at Falsani, Balmer, Peterson, Quinn & Buyer, and this evening's moderator. I'm pleased to welcome tonight's panelists who will be answering your questions about family law. First, Cheryl Prince of Hampfreedy Law Firm, Andrew Poole of the Poole Law Office, and Terry Trogdon of Gerlach, Bomir, and Trogdon Law Firm. Thanks for all, all of you for coming. We are ready to take your questions about family law. Call us locally at 218-788-2844 or toll free at 1-877-307-8762. Now let's start with some qu general questions. Something that we get calls at our office, even though we don't do a lot of family law, goes something like this. Why isn't there any fault in divorce anymore? What, what do you have to prove to get divorced these days, Terry? All you have to have is a disagreement about being married. And we call that uh, irre irretrievable breakdown of a marriage or ir irreconcilable differences. And if one person doesn't want to be married and wants to seek divorce, you really can't stop them. Uh, one of the reasons that under, is underlying this whole change from years ago when some people thought it was more fun is that you can preserve the family relationship if you are not dragging things out. It's also much less expensive to do it this way uh, because you're not having to go out and dig up dirt and do private investigators and everything like that we've always watched on old TV programs. Right, either prove cheating or fake it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and the, the reason that we get these kind of questions is, you know, somebody will call up uh, who's angry, Andrew, and will say, look, I don't even want to get divorced. Now, all of a sudden, I've got to pay a lawyer, and I'm being told I'm not going to get custody, and I've got to get part of my paycheck taken out to give the ex. Is that fair? What? Why is that? <laughs> well, and I don't know that that's necessarily a true question. Certainly, there seems to be some general feeling out there that if you're a male in a divorce, okay, then you're just going to have to pay all this money and money and spousal maintenance, child support if you have uh, children. That isn't uh, necessarily uh, true, though certainly if you have children, you're inevitably going to have to answer the question, is there going to be a child support obligation, right? And there is a, a calculator used to make that determination, but it's just not a matter of a judge just sitting there and uh, sticking it to a husband just simply because he is a male. Now there is a, a, a formula with, with considerations that are, uh, that are uh, taken into consideration in calculating the number. Uh, spousal maintenance is a little different in that uh, there isn't a calculator uh, to, where you can just plug in variables, for example, and out comes a spousal maintenance figure. There are factors under the law that a court would consider, but it would be up to a judge to make a determination. Um, but I, I think to circle back to your question, is it, is it fair? The process certainly tries to be fair. And uh, while there might be some uh, feeling that uh, one party just might be getting, you know, stuck with something, so to speak, uh, there are rules and laws that uh, help people sort through those issues. And hopefully they can rationalize, you know, the figures they're having to pay if they are going to have to pay something. There'd be a process for figuring that out. Well, then I realize this may be a more complicated question than we can answer, you know, briefly, but Cheryl, how do you figure out child support? How do you figure out who's supposed to pay and how much? Child support is based upon a variety of factors. The first is the income of the mother and the father. Then the amount of parenting time that the parents have with the children. There are three tiers. The parent, uh, they either have approximately equal periods of parenting time 
or there's a situation where one parent has no parenting time at all or very little overnight parenting time. And the third is the broadest category and the parent has between 10 and 45 percent of the parenting time. And as Andrew mentioned, there is a calculator. You put in the income of mother and the income of father. You describe the amount of parenting time, either one of those three tiers, and it will tell you basically the amount of child support you are paying for one child or two children or the number of children that you have. All right. Uh, does it matter how much, uh, say, one of the, the ex-spouses marries somebody else? Does it matter how much they make? The income of a new spouse does not count. It is not intended to be incorporated into the income calculation. It's only the income of the mother and the income of the father. Uh, we've had a call, uh, and there were a couple other questions about this, regarding mediation. Um, Terry, what are the alternatives regarding mediation or uh, resolving the, the dispute short of having a judge tell you what to do? In Minnesota, there's now an early neutral evaluation process. And what happens when there is a divorce petition filed, an ICMC, we've got a lot of acronyms here, an initial case management conference is scheduled. And the parties are offered the opportunity to meet with a neutral and uh, try to resolve the issues. That neutral process call, is called early neutral evaluation, or an e and &E. There's one that's called a social, which has to do with parenting time, and one that's a financial that has to do with assets. So that's an option, but it is a voluntary process. Traditional mediation is also an option, and it, it, it kind of mimics, or E&E &E actually kind of mimics mediation, and that's another way to resolve it. Um, they can also do um, settlement conferences between the parties with or without attorneys. A lot of things can happen short of actually going into a trial and having a judge make a decision. Who picks the mediator? If it is the E&E &E process, then it's done at the ICMC. There are a list of those who have been trained in that process, and the parties will negotiate who that should be. For a social, there are two that are uh, picked, a uh, male and a female, to make sure it's a balanced process. If no one can figure it out, the judge who is running the ICMC will assign someone from the list. For a mediator, parties can approach a mediator uh, privately and independently, and they can actually get a fully mediated agreement even before filing for divorce. And some people choose that because it's a much more confidential and private process. I've heard of something called collaborative law or collaborative uh, resolution. It sounds expensive, but wh what is that? Is that related to a mediation, Andrew? Uh, yes is the answer to that question. One of the first divorce cases I had was actually in uh, Itasca County. And as I sat down at council table, it was for an initial case management conference. I think it was Judge Maturi gave us a very long lecture on how divorce was back when he was practicing. It started. Uh, you just got the scheduling order that gave a time frame for discovery. You had a trial date uh, perhaps right out of the gate. It was a process that wasn't exactly designed to get people talking about resolution. Instead, right away you had this trial date and discovery and you're going through a very traditional rigid court process. It wasn't uh, really conducive to helping people just uh, get over their issues, resolve their issues and, and move on with life. So collaborative law um, is, you know, an approach that was fr has frankly been described by Terry here involving mediation, people putting their heads together, uh, trying to, to take the conflict out of a courtroom, uh, work together to uh, resolve the issues, and hopefully at the end of the day, everyone, um, well, will be satisfied with it, at least satisfied that they had a say in their agreement, rather than going through this court process where you're just handed a judgment and decree or a divorce order from a judge uh, who made the decision uh, for you. There's uh, a component of collaborative divorce which is a little bit different than mediation because right at the get-go when they decide to go into this process the parties agree that if they cannot settle this that they will both fire their attorneys and get new counsel. That's an expensive proposition and can be a real motivator to settlement. Uh, we've had a call, um, a question from a grandparent who uh, is trying to get visitation for um, some grandchildren he hasn't seen for several years, uh, according to the note here. 
Um, there's apparently been a, a judge's ruling um, that maybe didn't go in his favor. Um, how can a grandparent get visitation or maybe change a visitation order that's already been made? Uh, the threshold question that a grandparent needs to answer is first and foremost whether has, there has been a legal proceeding involving the family. If there has not been a legal proceeding, a divorce, a legal separation, a paternity, unfortunately the grandparent by statute is not permitted to ask for visitation or grandparent parenting time. It's um, a very, uh, it's a frustrating situation where you have two parents who um, are preventing the grandparent from not seeing the children. On the other hand, if there is already an order that um, the grants the grandparent visitation, they have the same rights to ask for to be modified if there is a change in circumstances and it is, a, or if it is the best in the best interest of the children that there be a modification of the grandparent parenting time. If on the other hand, this individual is not happy with the decision that the judge just made, he may have some recourse in asking the judge to review his decision, a motion for um, modification or, or reviewing it, or else he may have to take it up to the Court of Appeals, it's un which is unfortunately very long and financially draining process. Uh, we have a question. Um, I'm going to modify this a little bit. Um, a mother, I, I assume a custodial uh, parent, is not allowing visitation uh, for years. Um, what's the remedy for that? Is there a penalty for a parent just not allowing what uh, I'm assuming the courts have, have ordered? Terry? When a, anyone, but in this case you're talking about a parent, violates a court order intentionally and it's not, and it's possible for them to comply. Uh, then there could be a finding of contempt. So the parent who is, in, who is wronged, who is not violating the court order, can file a motion for contempt, must be able to point to the order that the alleged contempt is violating, and then can bring that forward. That is one of the fewer few um, motions that can be brought, which is likely to actually get some attorney's fees awarded, because the wrongdoer um, is intentional, but that's one of the findings. So there is a process, uh, but there are requirements, and it's important that whoever is going to seek a finding of contempt go through the process explicitly, but there is recourse. Uh, Andrew, we've got a question here um, about uh, custody. How old does a child have to be before he or she gets to choose which parent um, to live with. Yeah, well certainly the younger the child is, uh, the more difficult it is for that person to give significant input into it. There are times where the court can, pour, uh, can appoint a guardian ad litem uh, who would visit the children, uh, visit the family, and, and, and create a report or make a, a recommendation as to what would be in the best interest of the child. But there's no question as a child gets older, uh, they can and should have some say uh, with respect to uh, with which parent they would, you know, like to reside. Um, I believe uh, Minnesota statute says at 16 a, a judge can bring a child back into chambers and even ask them the, the simple question, where would you like to be? Maybe it's not as rigid as a specific age, but once you get around that time frame, the court is going to give significantly more consideration into the wishes of the child. But I think it's also important to mention that at no point does a child have the automatic right to choose. Um, Ultimately, it is up to the judge, and it is up to the judge in, in, uh, con, um, in talking with the parents and in moving forward with the legal process. The child does not have veto power. As a practical reality, that's why the older a child is, the more input and the more emphasis is placed on their opinion, but it is not a determination, and it is not a decision. It is simply an opinion and one piece of what the court de determines is in the best interest of that child. So maybe this is a frivolous question. If, if you're advising a parent of a teenager, you want to tell them, you know, go ahead and bribe a little bit, you know, <laughs> stay a little later, <laughs> you increase know, the whatever allowance. you want. You want a new, uh, 
you know, video game. Right? <laughs> Lovely idea. And I got to tell you, some parents do that. Unfortunately, however, that can also backfire. Judges don't like knowing and guardians don't like it when a parent is trying to influence the child. And that information is going to come out. And so I strongly suggest not trying to manipulate the situation. All right, Cheryl, we have a question about alimony, which is, is it called maintenance now? It is called maintenance. Okay. Uh, one um, spouse worked, was the sole provider, the other one did not. Assuming there's no children, what do you do about maintenance? Again, there's a variety of statutory factors, and as Andrew said, it's unlike child support, there is no calculator. The court is supposed to look at the, the factors and decide what the right solution is under the situation. It essentially is a balancing of income from of both parties and the need that they have. Um, it also, you look at the length of the marriage, the ability that the spouse asking for maintenance has to support him or herself, how long it might take them to get back on their feet, going back to school, um, getting time to get back into the workforce, um, the health needs of the parties, the ability of the obligor, the person who's supposed to pay maintenance, to, to pay for his own budget at the same time he's paying for spousal maintenance or she is paying for spousal maintenance. Um, it's a whole variety of circumstances, but essentially what it boils down to is a balancing of needs and income. But the, the reality is the, that it is not supposed to be a long-term um, financial obligation unless it's a long-term marriage and one person has really basically given up their ability to return to the workforce and to support themselves for the sake of the relationship that they've had. Is it permanent then in, in Minnesota? It is. It can be called permanent maintenance. Permanent maintenance, however, is not permanent. Permanent maintenance goes until there's a substantial change in circumstances indicating that there should be a change in maintenance. A lot of times there may be permanent maintenance, but one person or the other asks for maintenance to decrease or end when uh, the obligor, the person paying maintenance, retires um, because retirement typically triggers a decrease in income for the person who's paying maintenance, plus it might trigger an increase in income of the person receiving, because then they're now old enough to get the retirement benefits. If someone uh, loses their job, it might change, it, uh, it might trigger an, a request to modify maintenance. Uh, we're getting lots of questions, and that's good. Um, Terry, here's a question, uh, very common, I'm sure, in your practice. Uh, somebody's paying child support, loses a job. What do you do? Well, the the parent who is getting the child support is going to have to budget a little more tightly because they're not going to get a payment. But it's up to the person who's lost the job, if they are the payor, to make a motion to modify child support. Child support does not automatically change because of a job loss. It doesn't automatically change for any reason. Even if a child reaches the age of uh, 18 and graduates from high school, there still has to be something that says it changes. Uh, a little bit related question, um, the uh, viewer says, I'm paying hefty child support. The money does not seem to be going to the children. The viewer uh, looks like wants to support the children. What do you do then? Andrew. Is that a question for me? Yes. Well, it certainly is supposed to go to the children. I know there is a definition of support and what it's intended uh, to cover. I'm thinking of any circumstance I've had lately where there's been some egregious violation of it and it hasn't been going to the children. Have you? Well, I think the important thing that sometimes um, people who are paying child support, especially because of the strain it creates on their budget, the frustration they have is that they don't see direct um, benefit. Unfortunately, child support is actually support for food, clothing, and shelter. So a portion of each child support payment goes to pay the mortgage. It's intended to be the, the electric bill, the phone bill, all of the things that are necessary in order to pay a child. And just because the child doesn't eat that amount of, if you add up the actual expenses that you can relate directly to that child and that child only, uh, food, clothing, it's not going to add up to the amount because child support is much more than that. Um, we've had a number of questions here and I'm going to kind of summarize it. Why is the system biased in favor of the wife, mother, rather than the husband, father? Cheryl. I don't think I think that that is probably an overgeneralization. The system tries to be as objective and gender neutral as possible. It takes into consideration, however, 
factors that do have a tendency to be gender uh, gender roles. For example, the the woman more often than not is the one who stays home to take care of the children. As a result, she doesn't work. As a result, she's the one who's looking for maintenance. She ultimately is also the one who has a more day-to-day -day role with the children. So she may have, because of that role, not because of her gender, but because of that role as a caregiver, may have what is perceived to be an, an advantage in a custody case. Um, since the children are with her, that she's going to be getting child support. Again, it's not because of the gender, it's because of the roles that the parties have had in the system. It's a societal problem. It's, it's not a societal <laughs> problem. <laughs> um, Terry, here's a question. Um, uh, two children, uh, each parent have, uh, has his or her own home, uh, but the father does not contribute financially um, can he get away with not paying support? I may not have, I may not be quite following this, but um, does child support depend on uh, your assets as opposed to just your income? It depends on your income. That's actually the number that goes into the calculation. It's possible, and I have seen cases recently, where a parent who has more parenting time with the children, who is also a significantly higher wage earner, may actually pay child support to the other parent because of that. And it's the calculator that was referred to e uh, earlier that makes a difference in that. Because of the gender issue it becoming less and less important, we're seeing more and more women uh, out earning their husbands. And that's when you get, can get that unusual, well, it's, it's unusual now, but I think will be a more common result. Uh, Andrew, here's, uh, I think, another common situation for, for each of you. Uh, the viewer says, I want to move out of state with my children. Can the children's father stop me? Uh, he potentially could. You certainly just can't interfere with any parenting time rights that he may have. Um, and if you're going to simply pack up and move out of state, you certainly, I mean, that could happen. And you could potentially get a court order stopping a parent <laughs> from doing that. Um, but uh, if, I think part of it also depends on, is there an actual judgment and decree? I think it gets perhaps a little more difficult if the parties haven't even divorced yet, and one of the spouses is trying to take the children uh, and, and bring them to a different state. That, I think, can be problematic. Um, Cheryl, here's a question about uh, adoption. Uh, a man wants to adopt his stepdaughter. Uh, the biological mother is, is, is deceased. Um, the, uh, it sounds like the daughter, the stepdaughter, is an adult. Can you adopt an adult um, you can adopt. You can adopt an adult. And it is a much easier process, but you still have to do a petition. Um, but yes, you can adopt an adult. Uh, here's a question. Let me skim it first before I totally botch this again, Terry. <laughs> um, Married for 30 years, uh, husband worked uh, a steady job. Uh, does assuming he has to pay maintenance uh, upon divorce, uh, what happens when he dies? Is there ongoing maintenance based on a uh, death benefit? No. Uh, when someone dies, maintenance ceases, and it's typical though when you have a someone who's receiving one of the parties is going to be receiving significant maintenance for the person who is paying it to maintain a life insurance policy sufficient so that the spouse receiving maintenance would have some support even upon the death of the paying spouse. And I, I think we talked about it earlier, but um, if the paying spouse in, in a maintenance, maintenance, maintenance situation retires, there may or may not be an ongoing obligation, it sounds like. It's probably going to be modified, and for many cases, it's going to go um, downward. There are instances in which an individual works a longer period of time, their Social Security is pretty high, they have other income that is uh, required for them to be taken, and it's possible for their income to go up. Not likely, but it is possible, and it could be modified upward. Uh, Andrew, here's a question. Um, 
My wife received the house in our divorce, and I signed a quit claim deed. Um, now she's not making the mortgage payments, and the bank wants the person who doesn't own the house anymore to pay. What, what do you do then? Well, um, what I would like to know is if that person is still on the mortgage. Is that what the question is assuming, that the person is still on the mortgage? Because if, if that's the case, then I suppose a bank very well could be wanting the money from you if you're still attached to that note. I think the better practice would be to ensure that that person refinances, get your name off uh, the note. Once the divorce is, is finalized, uh, well, it sounds like, did you say they didn't sign the quick claim deed? It, this says the quick claim, quick claim deed was signed, was signed. but uh, somebody's not making the payments anymore. So then it's a matter of refinancing, I suppose, right. and ensuring that their name is off of that. I'm right, because the bank doesn't care if you get divorced. If you're on the note, you're going to maybe pay. And oftentimes, uh, divorce agreements contemplate uh, you know, how much time they have to refinance to get that other spouse's name off of it. It's uh, very typical to say, you know, 90 days or one year to accomplish that. Um, I would be curious to know if they had something like that in the language of their judgment and decree. Um, it would be worth looking into in some sort of effort to compel them or force them to make efforts to refinance. Uh, Cheryl, real quick, we're almost out of time. Uh, we've had a couple of questions about the cost of a divorce. I know it depends, um, but uh, ballpark, you know, what are we, what's somebody looking at depending on whether there's a custody dispute or asset division, that sort of thing? I wish I could say something more specific. <laughs> it depends. My, my, there's a $402 <coughs> filing fee, and then it's going to be based upon the hourly rate of the attorney. And it's going to be uh, under $1,000 if you agree on everything and just need the paperwork done, or many thousands of dollars if you argue over anything as inconsequential as the toaster. My suggestion is if folks want to do it themselves, they should, I think that's a great option, there's do-it-yourself forms, but have those forms looked at by a lawyer uh, because there are often details like Andrew talked about the refinance, it's not standard part of the form, and if it's not in there, it doesn't have to happen. So have a lawyer take a look at it for an hour's worth of time, it's well worth it. To some extent, I suppose it depends on how argumentative the parties are, huh? Correct. All right. Well, thank you very much. That was good. Uh, we had an uh, informative discussion here. That's all the time we have. I want to thank our panelists for sharing their knowledge tonight. Uh, remember, you can watch this show again online at www.wdse.org or on the Falsani, Balmer, Peterson, Quinn, and Beyer website, www.falsanibalmer.com. Uh, please join us again next week when we answer your questions about your obligations and rights when involved in a car crash. I'm Jim Peterson. Good night. <laughs>